Hi, and welcome to the Progressive Bitcoiner podcast. I'm your host, Trey Walsh. And today we have Margot Paez on the show. So this was such a good and rich uh, conversation and really appreciate Margot coming on to talk about a bunch of things. She's just such a wealth of knowledge um, and has so many good and unique perspectives from personal experience to, to Bitcoin to you know political advocacy and campaign work and a host of other things, not to mention her environmental work with Bitcoin mining. Uh, so this was a really, really good and rich conversation. Uh, a lot of the things we talked about were very much focused on progressives and progressive politics and where progressives, Democrats, left-leaning folks fall short. Um, the state of many things in our world and our country today, um, the ways to talk to people about Bitcoin and make Bitcoin a little bit more mainstream in the way we talk about it and so much more. So I really hope you'll uh, and really think you'll enjoy this conversation. And of course, as always, if you have any questions or any thoughts, um, even Margot mentioned her DMs are open on on Twitter, but also you can reach out to me on Twitter or at hello at progressivebitcoiner.com. And also want to continue mentioning that we're still running the uh, referral code for Jason Myers, a progressive's case for Bitcoin. So if you haven't gotten that book yet or you need to get more, the link's going to be uh, at the bottom here in the show notes. You're going to get 10% off that book using TPB uh, as the promo code in checkout. And also our uh, partnership with SAS Mining is continuing as well, where you're going to get $50 off a miner for using the referral code there. And they're using 100% renewable energy uh, to mine Bitcoin as well. So two awesome companies and organizations I really believe in. So check them out and please enjoy the show. And if you have any questions, reach out and we will see you again next week. Hi, Margot, and welcome, welcome back, I should say, to the Progressive Bitcoiner podcast, just a different, a different host this time. Yeah, Trey, it's amazing. I'm so glad that you and Mark connected and decided to bring this back. because I think it was really sad when Mark said he couldn't do it anymore. It really filled a, a void, you know, in the discourse around Bitcoin. So I'm really glad that you've taken this up. And thanks for having yeah, me back, too. No, I, uh, yeah, of course. Um, yeah, absolutely. I have to. Um, yeah. So what I'm realizing and kind of knew just from meeting Mark initially is like, Mark has a fan base. Mark has like a loving community that was like, oh, like we we love Mark and respect Mark. Um, as anyone who's met and interacted with Mark can feel. And I know this was like his baby as well. So wanting to take that on and well um it's yeah. it's been fun and he and i'd say this to many people like he's you know still here like i'm constantly communicating asking questions asking his perspective um and he's you know cheering on along the way and we'll keep being a guest advisor all of that good stuff too well let me just say i was there when mark first had the idea mm. for this show so you know i i remember when it was just an idea and yeah. then he started putting it together and finding guests. And yeah, so I, I mean, Mark is one of the, you know, quote unquote OG, yeah. you know, OGs of the progressive Bitcoin land, I guess, or subset of Bitcoiners. Yeah. He's, one, he's one of the very good ones. beloved. Yeah, yeah. He's a great guy. Absolutely. Fantastic yeah. person. Yeah, Cannot yeah. say <laughs> enough of and enough positive things about him. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, I will say too, for me to say to you face to face, you know, one of the things that got me excited about Bitcoin and seeing it as something that I could get into was probably your talk on Peter's podcast too. Um, well, I think it was your first talk on his podcast. It's nice. It was, yeah, it was my first time on Peter's uh, podcast. It was my second podcast ever. Oh, like wow. Bitcoin podcast. Yeah. Yeah. Was that a year and a half ago, two years ago? I'm not even sure at this point. It, I filmed it in March of 2022. Okay. So yeah. I believe, yeah. Yeah. So it's yeah. been over a year, or like a year and a half. Almost. Yes. So I wanted to, and if people haven't listened to that episode, they can refer to that one. And, you know, you've been, uh, you, was, you were on his podcast again recently. And so we'll try to, mix it yeah. up a little bit here but you know for this audience to hear what was it for you that that got you into bitcoin and that got you into analyzing i guess at a deeper level like the problems that exist in our in our world in terms of you know you've talked about occupy stuff before some of those things but what was your journey getting getting into this especially as someone that comes from that camp if you will 
Well, I mean, I was always into computers uh, since before I could read and write. And I always had an interest in open, free and open source stuff. Projects, I was really also, I was a big proponent of a free and open internet. So I was always, always tried to stay involved in projects like that and concerned about centralization of the internet. So I was trying to help out where, where I could around decentralization or v decentralization of the internet. So, and then also I was very much aware of WikiLeaks and WikiLeaks was really important to me and my upbringing, I guess you could say. And I remember when WikiLeaks started accepting Bitcoin and I just, what the thing is, is that I can't, you know, it's everything's a little bit of a blur because this was you know, around 2010 or so and my life was very different then. And uh, I remember on Democracy Now! So this is the interesting thing, I think. It, Democracy Now! is, you know, a, considered a grassroots sort of progressive left leaning news, independent news organization uh, supported through the Pacifica Foundation, which I also uh, have a connection to. But they were the ones who really reported about WikiLeaks in those days. And the government decided to cut WikiLeaks and Julian Assange off from the credit card companies. And he couldn't accept any, they couldn't accept donations through that route anymore. So they came out and said, we're going to accept Bitcoin. So I try to remember if it was I had seen something on Slashdot or if it was this thing about Assange accepting Bitcoin that was the, around the first time I really heard about Bitcoin. Part of me wants to say that I was already aware of Bitcoin at that point and was like, oh, wow, he's accepting Bitcoin. But it may have been that that was the first time that I had heard of it. And then there were occupiers who were Bitcoiners. I didn't know them. I didn't talk with them, but I have a photo somewhere of somebody at a rally at Occupy LA with a Bitcoin sticker. And I purposely took a photo of that because I was like, oh, hey, Bitcoin. <laughs> so Bitcoin was always there in the background for me. And at some point in the early 2010s, I did try to mine Bitcoin, download a wallet, things like that. But I really didn't see the point of it completely. I was... I just really didn't have a good sense of economics or money or the importance of money and, or like why the central banks mattered and and the Federal Reserve and all that. So I just thought, well, this thing is consuming my CPU and I just don't have, I just don't see the point of dedicating all the CPU to, to mining Bitcoin and I'm just going to, I'd rather like help with SETI, <laughs> you know, SETI at home. So I'll just run that instead. So that was really, you know, my, my horrible early interactions with Bitcoin of not understanding it. But it wasn't until 2018, really, when I realized that Bitcoin was really, really valuable in the sense that it provided a monetary system that was outside of our existing monetary network or monetary system because I was seeing a lot of content creators being deplatformed. And some of them were people that I liked and, and a lot of them were people I didn't like. But the thing is, is that I saw that there were, uh, you know, groups of people that would go after people they didn't like, let's say, you know, alt-right, uh, quote unquote, alt-right figures, like at the time Richard Spencer and I think that's his name, right? Yeah, and and a couple other people who were sort of in that group, and even Jordan Peterson around that time got deplatformed as well. And the thing is, is that they wouldn't just go after these individuals; they would go after the entire platform. And I saw, I think it was called Subscribestar. I saw Subscribestar completely be deplatformed, and they had over a hundred or so maybe like 150 content creators on their platform. And all it, it was was because a couple of these alt-right types uh, decided to create accounts on their platform that the people who didn't like them went and reported them to PayPal and Stripe. And PayPal and Stripe said, you know, we don't want anything to do with this. So they completely deplatformed the entire content creator platform, which was called Subscribestar. So over 150 or so people lost their ability to make money through this platform. 
And I, I thought that was really unfair to them because they were they had nothing to do with these guys, you know, that had shown up and created profiles there. They and yet they were harmed by this. And I thought that, you know, all of this stuff is really dangerous. This this kind of behavior, this sort of mob mentality. And I thought, you know, we need a way, we need a different approach. So that's, I, I started building a, a content creator platform and I had incorporated BTC Pay Server. And so that was really the first time that I got really serious about using Bitcoin and the value of it. And from there, everything just sort of grew in terms of my interest and understanding and that I had to reconcile the climate stuff because also around that time I had switched to doing my research on climate change related topics, climate impacts and climate modeling. And I had to reconcile, you know, whether it was ethical for me to use Bitcoin, to be involved with Bitcoin. And I almost, you know, completely abandoned it for, (laughs) it's crazy to say this now, but for Cardano and Algorand and, thankfully, you know, I listened to enough podcasts and heard some what the miners were saying and did my own reading into it and realized, okay, yeah, this actually makes sense. There's a lot of good here. And I don't really have to, I don't have to worry too much about the ethics. There's room for improvement, for sure, uh, on that side. But, you know, it's not any worse than uh, what's than what most, you know, most of society in terms of the fossil fuel stuff. And it has a lot of potential just built into the network itself with how it works uh, with the mining side of things and the mining economics to actually end up being a very sustainable protocol. So yeah, that's basically my story. It's a little long winded, but it goes back a bit. It just shows, you know, uh, how easy it is to, miss something (laughs) if you don't understand money. Yeah. Well, I think that's also, you know, this day and age and for for a while now, people only getting information from social media and from Twitter and this very like clickbaity headline information on really complex issues is one of the biggest problems that we continue to face. Um, And so I think that speaks to a lot of what you're talking about is that people can't necessarily only do their research on that. It's it's a really complex thing. So, you know, for you, you mentioned two really, really important things like, uh, you know, the cancellation and content creators and then the environment, you know, in your day-to-day life, speaking with friends, family, you know, f- folks from the tribe of the left, things like that, what do you continue to see being the main sticking point um, for them with Bitcoin? Uh, well, of course, the environmental aspect of it is a big concern, and it's a big turnoff for most people. They think that Bitcoin is melting the planet, or it's just awful, it's just doing horrible things, and it's making climate change worse. And unfortunately, a lot of these perceptions are based off of really bad, poorly designed um, research papers that were published in the past. And unfortunately, even though there's been plenty written about them, even within the journals that they were published, they those ideas still continue to exist and are repeated nonetheless in the news, unfortunately. So there's that. And then I think for another subset of the left, there even if they can reconcile the environmental aspect of it, they still think that the economic side of it is very uh, incompatible with their beliefs. And I I think that that is also a misunderstanding of the network. And But I also think that we have not done a lot of justice or a lot of research on that aspect, which is uh, to say, I think, you know, okay, so let me go back a few steps on that. So, you know, in 2016, Bernie Sanders... Uh, maybe it was 2020, Bernie Sanders brought Stephanie Kelton on as one of his economic advisors. And she is well known as being one of the main proponents and advocates of modern monetary theory. 
Now, the reality is, yes, modern monetary theory is in direct opposition to, you know, a, an economic system or a monetary system where there is a cap, right, a 21 million Bitcoin cap that does go in opposition to modern monetary monetary theory. And it's also Bitcoin is a decentralized network, right, or distributed network. And then modern monetary theory is all about central banks controlling, having a monopoly on money. They That is a core feature, and it's not one that they see they have a problem with. Now, the thing is, is that uh, Democrats or Bernie-crats, we could call them, really saw this, you know, like, oh, yeah, Stephanie Kelton, monetary, modern monetary theory. And I remember, because I volunteered on the campaign in 2016 and 2020 and 2016, I knew somebody who was really into modern monetary theory. And the first time I heard it, and this is very funny, but uh, the first time I heard her say she was going to a modern monetary theory conference, I thought she was talking about a conspiracy theory. <laughs> I was mm, like, right. what is this? It sounds like a really, it's such a weird name. Anyway, so a lot of people on the left and also, but mainly those who, who were brought in through Bernie Sanders and then that movement see modern monetary theory as a way out, a way to fund and support progressive policy, progressive ideas, you know, universal health care, things like that, basic, uh, maybe universal basic income, or, you know, there's the jobs guarantee component that they talk a lot about, uh, you know, uh, all of these like state public I- policies that they would love to see that a lot of us would, would be happy with. Uh, they think that the only way to do it is with modern monetary theory. So for them, Bitcoin is doesn't make any sense. And so we really have not done a very good job, I would say, talking about these aspects when it comes to Bitcoin. Like, how would you support progressive ideas under a Bitcoin standard of any kind, of however way you define it? What is a Bitcoin? What is a progressive Bitcoin standard, you know? And I think that's something that we have really not addressed very well. And I've tried to explore that a little bit in the past. And I, I want to get back to this at some point, but I have sort of priorities of things that I need to take care of first. And the environmental side is right now a really big priority. But, you know, I, I tried to explore this a little bit, like looking into degrowth and trying to reconcile things there because there are there is a big strain of de- degrowth or a- ecological economics that I think aligns very well with Bitcoin. And I think that we really need to focus on this as well in order to get people to understand or to see that there are alternative ways of running an economic system that does not have to involve, you know, um, a monopoly on money, uh, or a central bank, or whatever it is, you know, that you have a problem with, and you think that Bitcoin can help with, right, you have to reconcile those. And you have to, we also have to do a better job of confronting or addressing the concerns around inequality, or distribution of Bitcoin, and whether that would exacerbate uh, income inequality, right, I don't have all the answers on that either. And I, I think it really depends on what you think a Bitcoin standard means or, uh, you know, hybrid Bitcoinization, or if that's even a thing that should be part of this vision or this progressive viewpoint on Bitcoin. Right. So I think there is so much here on the economic side that needs to be addressed for us to reach uh, those on the left who have concerns. But I I don't think it would it's that hard. But. I think that those are the basically those are the two main issues that keep progressives away from Bitcoin. First, the environmental side, then the economic side. So even though right now we're really focused on the environmental side, we have to be ready for the economic side because that will still be a big hurdle once they get past the environmental side of things. Yeah, and I think it already is for many Bitcoiners, but specifically progressive Bitcoiners already. Like, let's say we get past the environmental side, looking at what you and Troy are talking about, what Daniel's talking about over in in New Zealand, many others, um, Jared, doing a lot of good 
research where it didn't exist before. And it's like, okay, it's a little more complicated than miners just use a lot of energy, right? So it's getting into it. Um, you actually see there are many benefits and you don't want to overstate, but you don't also don't want to understate those environmental benefits. So I think that next hurdle, even for Bitcoiners, even myself, is thinking about inequality, thinking about hoarding Bitcoin. What does that look like? And I think too many Bitcoiners just say, well, you know, we Bitcoiners see the world differently. And if we were in charge, we would run things better. So just trust us, which the whole point is to not. So, you know, we'll be rich, but trust us, we'll take care of everyone and everything. Yeah, that and, doesn't work. Right, exactly. <laughs> I don't believe in that. <laughs> no, 100%. And there are many people that might look at Bitcoiners or certain Bitcoiners and be like, I don't want to live in their citadel. I don't want the world to be run by them, right? And that's also not the point. So I think that's a good thread to pull on a little bit now, a little bit offline, a little bit. I think there's a lot of policymakers and researchers and money that needs to go into what are policies that can be built around degrowth and thus coupling with Bitcoin would be really, really um, interesting to to pull on. Because um, I, yeah. I, I've been thinking about that more and more. And, you know, a lot of it, a lot of the conversations I'll have with friends or anyone is initially just like, what is Bitcoin, right? So we're not even getting to that step yet. But that's a really good point. And you're exactly right. Like we do need answers on that. It's not enough to say, well, just like, just, you know, let's keep investing in Bitcoin, use it peer to peer, the tech stuff's cool and the environment stuff. But like, how is it going to address the issues we progressives really care about? I, I, there's not a good articulation yet. You're hundred percent right about that. Right. Exactly. There's not. And I, I think though that there's foundations for it through the work that Bradley Rettler and Andrew Bailey have done. So I would love to see you have conversations with both of them about this stuff because they have thought about it. And I think they would uh, be able to bring up because they're philosophers. And I think philosophers are really great at coming up with the right questions to ask. And so I would love to hear them, you know, raise those like big questions. Like what are the big questions? How do we frame this, you know, so that we can dig into it and develop it and then bring in the economics, bring in the degrowth. Because I do think that going the route of ecological economics and degrowth is probably going to be the best way for us to reconcile that, at least in terms of the research that I've done. And and um, there has to be room for us to also say like, you know, you can create your own currencies, like complementary currencies, and they could be managed in a way where you do have elasticity in the currency. But then you would want to back that by Bitcoin because you want to have some kind of sound money foundation, some good money foundation that you know that is accountable in a certain way. So like, I think that these are like my ideas in terms of how you know, like foundationally, you could begin to reconcile some of that. But yeah, I would love to hear Andrew and, and Bradley really go at it on this because they have, you know, deeper philosophical thinkings on it and have written stuff on the inequality aspects. And Bradley's also, you know, considers himself a progressive. So he's thinking from an inequality perspective as well. And I think Andrew is uh, also, even though he doesn't label himself, I think he's he's also, you know, more open-minded, sort of, I don't, don't want to label him as a leftist or anything or progressive, but I was just telling him yesterday that he's starting to sound like uh, David Graeber. So he's got, he has the right ideas around liberty and, and, and all that. So I think, I think he's a great guy. Yeah. And I've been, uh, a f- a few of us too come from, it's really interesting. And Troy talked about this openly on the uh, Blue Collar Bitcoin podcast. I remember like a year and a half ago, um, going to Wheaton College. And that's there's a small group of colleges called the Contemporary Christian Council of Universities or something like that, right? And I went to one as well called Gordon College in Massachusetts. And it's funny, there's a few of us Bitcoiners that have like a previous like evangelical Christian background now or like progressives, philosophical kind of like 
out of religion. I'm a little bit more on the the agnostic realm, I think. But kind of several... like Chris Hedges, right? Like the Chris Hedges side of the of yes, the left. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, it's funny. And then once I heard Troy say that, I was like, I knew there was a reason. Like, I you, you just have some similar background. So a few of those folks and the the Bitcoin philosophers come from that camp, and it's really. Um, interesting, but we're definitely gonna have Bradley on to talk about all of this. I know um, he and others have been busy with their book that they're working on, and he's talked about Peter's podcast. So I'm hoping and very eager and excited to to take a look at that book um, and and to read that when that does come out, because I, I I think and know they're gonna talk about some of that in the book and hopefully get the word out in a lot of ways on whatever conversation, podcast, you know, university tours to. Fortunately, unfortunately, and I know you pulled on this thread recently when it, we can either go into it or not, but talking about academia and what Bitcoin even means to academia, like I was just talking to Andrew recently as well about like my backgrounds in sociology and there's not enough sociological research around Bitcoin, right? There's a lot of political science, economics, environmental stuff is great. The next phase I want to see is that sociological study, um, inequality, and just have like a I hate to say it this way, like real academics actually look at it and take it seriously in that realm, um, which hasn't to uh, an obvious enough degree, I guess. Yeah, I agree. We need a lot more research. And of course, the thing is, is we need researchers who understand Bitcoin and, and use Bitcoin, I think. And it's... And also understand inequality and are like well respected and, right. in their their fields right and again not to get into the whole like if you're an ivy and have a phd stamp and just because a lot of bitcoiners would be like oh that's you know whatever that's the the old regime that we shouldn't be listening to this and that like no it's people that have devoted you know 20 30 years of their life to academic research and study in a particular field or you know uh philosophy sociology whatever and they're also like really knowledgeable on on bitcoin right it, it, it's got to be both um, that would be really exciting. And I, I think it's it's coming. Yeah, I, I hope so. I hope it is. I'm trying. I'm trying to do something there. But it is it is challenging. I still read lots of papers that are awful and written by people who don't understand Bitcoin, who have never used it and are using, you know, statistical tools and coming to really wrong conclusions because they have developed a model, but they don't understand the real world approach to it. So they can't actually, and they're not able to compare their model to the real world to see the failures of their model or the limitations of their model. So uh, I think that's a really big challenge, but it's just something like Troy has said this before, like you have to have skin in the game. And I think that the problem is that a lot of researchers don't have skin in the game. Like they're not, they've never touched Bitcoin. They've never had a wallet, like a Bitcoin wallet. They've never sent anything over lightning. And I think that's really important to be able to study something. I mean, you have to know how it works. And the only way to know how it works is to actually play with it. You don't have to hold any Bitcoin to do research on it, you know, you, but you do have to play with it and have that curiosity. And I think that's lacking in the academic world in the, and on the research side. And unfortunately, you know, we've talked about the, the, the issues that, that turn people off, like the, which is mainly the environmental side, I think. And that has really, really poisoned the minds of a lot of researchers well-meaning researchers who are reading these articles and are saying, oh God, this is terrible, but they have no way to assess the methodology because, you know, they don't, it's not their area of expertise and they don't know how Bitcoin works. So yeah, there's just, it's just an uphill battle, but I think ultimately it's just, um, it's up to us to, to do the good work, to do that research. So I know there's an undergrad who's studying so sort of uh, social sciences, I think, at Cornell, and hopefully she might do some good on the social sciences side. And I think there was somebody recently at U USC who interviewed a few people who was doing some kind of sociology graduate level work. So, you know, it takes time. And I, I think it's going to take probably the younger generations, millennials, Gen Z and younger to make those changes in, in terms of the research. I think the older generations are a little bit challenged. As far as I can tell, you know, it's 
maybe it's just not native enough for them to appreciate what we're doing. Yeah. Well, I think a couple of things too. There's never been anything that's existed like Bitcoin. Again, not to put an actual like Bitcoin on a pedestal, because I think so much of what I'm on about and a lot of us are on about, it's not just about Bitcoin. It's about like, what are the things that Bitcoin's addressing? Like what is wrong with Wall Street? What is wrong with the Federal Reserve? What is wrong with our global monetary system? What is wrong with dictatorships? What it, it and you know, on and on, right? Like Bitcoin doesn't solve each one of those things, but it's a good starting point to to unravel the thread of all of that. Um, you know, I, I think there's that. Like it's never nothing like this has ever existed before. And it's only like 14 years old, whatever it is now. Um, it, it's really young. Like that is that is crazy. And having a recent conversation too, you talk about like philosophy and cultures, like there's been so many tectonic shifts in Bitcoin already from the block size wars to today and so many things in between in terms of cultures, in terms of actual policies, everything like that. A lot is happening in this short amount of time in Bitcoin already. And a lot of things don't get actualized on currencies, economics, things like that for 50, 60 years. So it's like, you know, we don't know where this is going to go. It's, it's exciting, but it can be frustrating to be patient, I think, in the process too. But for people to know, like, it's still so early that these things take time. Um, the FUD and addressing it takes time. And for progressives that ideally will hopefully get more and more folks from the left or just a mainstream audience listening who might not really know much about Bitcoin. And for those that are listening that are in that camp, you know, just automatically hearing things like the biggest thing is environmental concerns and then like just money in general. And I'm wondering if you could talk about that from my sense on the left, a lot of folks on the left just, and I did myself, especially as an undergrad, like 10, 12 years ago, whatever, um, viewed money as just evil, like money, wealth, anything to do with it is just icky. It's just a weird thing to talk about the left just the left doesn't talk about it but we want to fix problems in the world that kind of require money or require people to have some money so it's it's that's also a, a factor as well i think just money in general i think it's naivety you know a certain naiveness about the economic system and i was certainly one of those people i always for a long time felt like uh, i would rather see money abolished because i thought money was just basically causing all sorts of problems. And, and, and I didn't like seeing, you know, uh, the in inequality, income inequality, and poverty and all of that. And so I, I spent much of my, my young adulthood thinking that we should just completely abolish money. And that's, a, that's not an unusual belief on the left. Let's just get rid of all money. Why do we need it? But, but, you know, money is, it's a technology and markets are a technology too. And I, and the more that I have experienced how markets work and the more I realize that actually markets can be a tool for the left and they can be a form of direct action. And I think that that's something that we are really not utilizing and we're, we're missing an opportunity because when it came to comes down to climate change, the thing that really drove me to Bitcoin was that I saw this in action, government in action, and how can we stop that? I mean, how can we get around that? Right, we have to find a way to right reduce decarbonize our society to get off of fossil fuels, and if the government is not going to do that, we have to do that. But it has to be more than just stand, you know, more than standing in front of a pipeline and blocking it, which I think is 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 a great idea too. Like, go ahead, stand in front of a, you know, stop stop the oil, make you know, make a stance like that. I think that's that has a role and that should continue. But I also think that we're missing an opportunity uh, to to change things. Through, through the marketplace, because the market itself is is generally uh, a decentralized thing. Uh, and anyone can really come into a market and do something, start a company or, you know, like start a company or invest in a company. 
and then just start building, right? I mean, that's basically how a market economy works. And so I think we're really missing an opportunity there. And with Bitcoin, I saw, well, look, here's one way we can do that with, with Bitcoin mining. You know, we can set up, we can monetize at these uh, like baseload in Kenya. We can create a revenue for for renewable energy like solar and wind. And you don't need the government to do that. You're you're incentivizing it through the market. And that's direct action. Like I'm saying like, yeah, I want to support that. I could create a mining company. How is that? You know, when I think about like, how is that not a kind of direct action? If you have the right people motivated to do it and to do it collectively, right? Like you could organize to set up a mining operation or a mining cooperative, right? Like an you could do something like that. And I think uh, there is nothing there that is in opposition to left ideals or even to Marxist uh, ideology or Marxist ideas. Because when you listen to Richard Wolff, he's always talking about, you know, Richard Wolff, he, he makes a distinction, right? This is something that a lot of Bitcoiners who come out of uh, libertarianism or the right or just don't have a lot of understanding of left politics. Right? They think that Marxists are, all Marxist is is like this Marxist-Leninist thing where it was a top-down uh, authoritarian thing that happened. And yes, it did happen. But but that's not all that the left is about, right? There's anarchists, but there's also Marxists who have recognized that that approach didn't work, right? The just pure centralization and having the state run the economy wasn't the best idea. Okay, so they've developed, they've progressed in their understanding. And Richard Wolff is one of those people. And one of the things he says is, well, you know, what we need is to democratize uh, the economy, democratize business, uh, democratize the corporations or the companies. And how do you do that? He well, he talks about uh, cooperatives, worker cooperatives, you know. And so what I'm saying is like, you know, if you take that perspective, then do, you know, Bitcoin isn't, and markets are direct, can be direct action. And I, you know, what Richard Wolf is saying is direct action. And so there's just, there's no hypocrisy in any of that. So I'm completely gone off on a tangent here. No, it's uh, good. Yeah. But but I'm trying to get back to what what was the main point of what I, why I was saying all of this. But I don't think that, uh, you know, oh, money, like, I just don't, I think that we're really limiting ourselves on the left by only thinking that the main important things are mutual aid and um, and working outside of the economic system and, and thinking that we don't need money and that we don't need an economic system. I think this is very... Uh, very small, very narrow in our viewpoint. And, and I think that there's no reason for us to, to limit ourselves. Mutual aid is really important, of course. And, and, um, you know, direct action in terms of protesting is really important. But I think the markets as a form of direct action is also really important. And I, I, I wish that we would not be afraid of that because the more you learn about how markets work and the more you learn about how money works, the more you realize, oh, okay. So there are things that I can do to improve my life and I don't have to, you know, be a slave to my boss. So I think that really changes things if we allow ourselves to, to engage in the market, but not necessarily saying like, as capitalists, but but doing it strategically, I think that's really important, and using money strategically as well. Yeah, I think a lot on the left view, and I, and I certainly did um, view markets, free market, capitalism, all of all of those talks as intrinsically tied to like Exxon Mobil, BlackRock, like the things that that do exist, and what we're I think what we're seeing instead is just government intermingling and connections with the way things have been and running. And that is, that is not the market principles you're discussing. Like you're talking about philosophically or the way that it 
that it has worked and, and does in many instances, those other things, when people view the evil corruption, I think we, we Bitcoiners, when we're talking about that, those are the things we don't want to continue. Um, and, and I think that w- once that connection gets made for folks, um, that's a really important one. And th- now, do you ever talk to people about Occupy and really connecting that with Bitcoin or the great financial crisis? Is that one of your leading things that you like to think about and talk about in terms of Bitcoin? For for me, that's that's one of the things I start with in terms of what's the problem. It might not be my like main like Bitcoin point about you know the environment, things like that. Do you think that's a strong thing to advocate for to people on the left? Um, do you not, you know, how much how much weight do you put into that? Well, I think it's a really important connection to Bitcoin, to why Bitcoin? Because Occupy was it was a lot of things, but primarily it was, you know, saying these banks have too much power and why is the government bailing them out and letting them take advantage of the average person? Why isn't the government protecting the average person. I thought that was the role of government to protect its citizens from some, you know, predators like predatory banks. And and one of the actions that happened at Occupy was this divestment movement to take your money out of the big banks and put it into community banks. And to me, it's like so obvious, right? Well, if you still feel that way, the next obvious step is to be your own bank. And the way to do that is with Bitcoin. Like it's the fundamentally the best and most reliable cryptocurrency out there. And it's built really on this foundation that there's something wrong with our banking system. And and I think that that should be the starting point and the way to get to people. But I sort of wonder now if people have lost sight of what, what all of this is now these days, you know, where we came from the great financial crisis, 2008 to where we are now in 2023, the, what happened there with the financial crisis, really the fundamental point, you know, you know, when I think people started to realize, Oh, okay, there's something wrong here. Things aren't working the way they should be. And, and since then, everything has sort of happened, I think, as a result of this big economic failure that happened then and and all of the, the inequality that we see and people turning to drugs as well and, and the decline in, in lifespan and, and all of that, I, you know, I, I feel like 2008 was that turning point that really made that difference. But these days, I sort of wonder if people have forgotten that. And have become so engrossed in identity politics and fighting each other over that kind of stuff and in losing sight of who the real problems are, who, where the real problems lie or who the real enemies are, you know, and, uh, and I don't know if those same ideas resonate with people or you really have to remind them. I just not, I'm not sure. I mean, you know, like the... The whole thing with the Wall Street bet stuff and and uh, uh, GameStop and AMC, I saw a lot of people who were involved in that who were still angry about what happened during the the Great Financial Crisis. You know, they were like, "Yeah, I'm doing this because my family lost their job, they lost their home, blah blah blah." Right. So I see there is a lot of that anger still there, but I I also see a lot of people who don't talk about that stuff anymore. And it's all about, you know, culture war stuff or like, or COVID. And, and I, I worry that, that we're sort of late in getting to people using Occupy because people are thinking about other things now. And, uh, and I don't know, but I hope so. I hope it's still a good way to reach people because it is the fundamental thing that drove that drove the left and made it possible for Bernie Sanders to run in 2016. He is the Occupy president, and he would not have been able to run on a platform of the you know the 99 percent versus the one percent or us not me. You know all of these slogans had it not been for the Occupy movement. So I just think so. I you know it's all there. I just think that 
I don't know, society is kind of is moving in a different direction. So I'm not sure if we have to think of different ways of reaching people now or if that's still good enough. Yeah, there there's definitely meeting people where they're at, which I would argue that, you know, I'm trying to do, Jason Meyer's trying to do, you're trying to do, so many others. You know, there's a mix of like, I want to meet progressives where they're at. But I also want to say, hey, like, we are really, really obsessed with the things that you mentioned, and we're losing sight of what are what are really those things underneath that make it so easy for us to be so sick as a nation, as a world, so obsessive with these identity politics stuff compared to some of these underlying things that we're seeing in Bernie Sanders messaging, we're seeing in the Occupy movement. So I think it's so important to remind people, even if they don't care or it doesn't impact them, and a lot of people that are most loud, loudest about identity politics are those that are in an economically safe and stable environment a lot of ways. Or they might not be, but there's such a learning curve to even figure out how would you address that, that they don't know how to even address that. So they get angry about something else because people are just angry. They're sad. They're depressed. They're all, all of these things, right? And kind of leading, it's my next point. I want to talk about the Democratic Party and progressive movement today and going forward, you know, one of the things that's really tough is figuring out where to go from here when the Democratic Party today, and I just saw another ad from Joe Biden a couple of weeks ago, like popped up on my YouTube. So many things I could say about the appearance of the ad, his speech, all of these things, right? Just the, the visualization of it, but just this is the fight for our democracy, this and that's the same messaging every four years now, right? Both sides, it's a fight for our democracy, um, kind of tied to identity politics a little bit more. So, you know, you yourself, do you find yourself being still pretty political in terms of a voting sense, in terms of a party affiliation? Um, and how do you feel about the Democratic Party and the progressive movement going forward? I think 2020 was pretty soul crushing for me, to be honest. I like I said I volunteered on Bernie Sanders campaign both times and in 2020 I was a victory captain so I was a volunteer in charge of volunteers and I would lead uh, canvassing in 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 Atlanta and also I led uh, a group of people over to South Carolina to do door knocking there on election day for the South Carolina primary and. I saw, you know, from that perspective, just how we were so close to winning. I felt we were really close to taking this primary. And then to see the power of the DNC consolidate behind Biden and using Obama to bring the other candidates in line. And to see Elizabeth Warren take cheap shots at Bernie Sanders over empty claims of sexism and to treat him the way he did on stage, Uh, I will never forget. (laughs) This was just, it was too much for me. I mean, the way she treated him on stage, like he was a pariah, like he had done something so wrong. I mean, the guy didn't do anything wrong. Everybody knows Elizabeth Warren is an opportunist who pretended to be, in, you know, indigenous to get, you know, ahead in her career. I mean, and look at her now, right? Like she's done so many things. She's she's an anti crypto army or something. Like I mean, she, you just see how empty she is, and and she. First she of all, can that, we just right? talk about how, like, <laughs> let's say someone so hates angry. crypto. You know, no, like, it's so funny. And, <laughs> and for those that don't know, I've mentioned it before. I'm, you know, in Massachusetts, Elizabeth Warren is one of my lovely senators. Um, and, but even if you're not into crypto, to hear like an anti crypto army, and then her camp actually said that she has said that, put it on. I, when I first saw that image, I thought it was a joke. Like someone just put that. I was like, oh, that's funny. I'm like, wait, her campaign actually did that? How? silly is that how juvenile and childish is is that in this day and age with all the problems we could be talking about and focusing on that i mean a lot of things solidified uh, similar to to you you know i wonder if there's any 
real Bitcoiners and progressives that like weren't Bernie, Bernie bros or Bernie, <laughs> Bernie, Bernie fans previous to this. That would, that would be a funny poll. Um, yeah, that kind of, ugh, gosh. Yeah. No, it was, she's awful. Yeah. It's ridiculous. The, the anti-crypto stuff that I see on the, on the democratic side in the Senate and the house is just so ridiculous sometimes. It, yeah, and it's like they're lampooning their sel- themselves. Yeah. It's embarrassing. And listen, if you're listening and you <laughs> like Elizabeth Warren and voted for Elizabeth Warren, uh, I was the same way and and am in a lot of ways of a lot of her policies and takes on certain subjects. So I don't want to completely, you know, vilify someone if that is, you know, that that's your candidate. But I would say in a lot of ways, think about some of the things Margo just said, uh, you know, that mm-hmm. opportunist uh, takes these stuff against Bitcoin, crypto, and other topics that someone clearly has not researched. You know, you don't need to and probably shouldn't really trust any politician wholeheartedly, but especially when someone's being as disingenuous as that, you know, I, I take a step back and just kind of take a look and analyze, you know, what are, what are we doing here? Well, look, I was like anybody. I was a supporter of Elizabeth Warren. I think in 2015, I, I initially wanted her to run for president and then Bernie came in and was like, whoa, Bernie Sanders. Okay. Yeah. He's mm-hmm. got this long record. And I remember him from period, you know, when he did this, like, uh, he, uh, he, what is it called when you, uh, when you like talk for like 15 hours, <laughs> he, uh, oh, so like filibuster, he filibustered, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You yeah. know, over healthcare and mm-hmm. he, right. So, but I was, I was a big supporter of her. I thought she was great on, on banks and stuff. And, and she's just done, she's, she's been the complete opposite since that. I mean, it's just been, she's just been very disappointing to me, but you know, so yeah, the consolidation of the DNC, uh, the betrayal of Elizabeth Warren, Elizabeth Warren's betrayal of Bernie Sanders, you know, and then when COVID happened, the campaign and the volunteers all agreed that we were not going to do any type of outreach to ask people to go out and vote in Wisconsin because, oh, we didn't want them to put their lives in danger. This was so early on. It was in March. We really there was very little that we knew about COVID at the time and the risks. And we didn't want anyone to die or get seriously ill. So Bernie agreed with us and said, I'm not going to campaign. And Joe Biden, on the other hand, went on TV and said, it's safe. Go out and vote for me. You know, and it's like, you see that and and you just know that these people, these the Democratic Party, the insiders, the DNC, like they're all horrible people. And and not to mention what happened on Super Tuesday when Bernie Sanders should have had all this momentum coming out of Super Tuesday, but instead somehow the results were delayed and delayed and delayed and he didn't get to have that momentum. And so to me, like all of that on top of what happened in 2016, just has completely demoralized me, I would say. It was soul crushing to see this happen and to say like, okay, what is, you know, how much power do I really have to the political system, through the party system? You know, so I have become, well, I think a lot more jaded in that regard. So I'm much more interested these days in what I can do outside of of the existing systems, which is, again, why I'm attracted to using Bitcoin, especially on the environmental side, but also on the social and economic side. And uh, I'm just trying to find ways where I don't have to rely on politicians to do the right thing. That's where I'm at right now. But I'm also very interested in, in how things are playing out for 2024, I think, you know, Robert Kennedy Jr. coming into the race is very interesting because he's got the name recognition being a Kennedy. So that gives him instant points. And so that makes him a hard challenger for Biden to ignore. And I, I think Biden, I think Democrat, you know, any incumbent needs a primary challenger to push them. And I, I'm hoping to see that happen for the uh, this time around, even though they've said they're not going to do primary debates, it's clear that uh, Bobby Kennedy Jr. has that ability to bring in crowds and 
fundraise and to get his name out there and to get his opinions out there. So they can't really ignore him. But I'm I'm also, you know, intrigued by of course, I love Mary, Marianne Williamson, and I, and I would really wish that they would do a debate because I really enjoyed seeing her on the debate stage last time. And it's just nice to see different perspectives on the debate stage. And then now uh, uh, Cornell West is running and he's running. Well, initially he was running with the People's Party. And now it sounds like he switched to the Green Party, which I, I, I understand why he did that, because it's a lot easier for him to get on ballot in all 50 states if he goes with the Green Party. But I totally understand why he did the People's Party, too, to begin with. So I think that's also really fascinating, too, because you still have these elements of the progressive movement in there uh, for the the Bernie Sanders supporters, Marion Williamson and Cornell West, trying to, trying to make an impact in any way that they can through the political system. And there are great voices to do that. And Bobby Kennedy Jr., he's not really, I wouldn't consider him a progressive, but he brings in a much needed voice, I think, uh, and a contrarian voice on certain issues. And he's very pro civil liberties, which I think is lacking these days. And so I appreciate that. You know, I'm not a big fan of some of his vaccine positions, but on the other hand, I don't see anything wrong with uh, with contrarian voices so long as they're balanced. Like I would love to hear him talk more about how he would balance his own opinions so that there is uh, not a push in either direction like towards, you know, corporate pharmaceuticals dominating. And I would also not to want to see a direction where alternative medicine or, you know, alternative, you know, non-mainstream views on, on vaccines dominate either. I think you're going to need pressure, you know, to, to do better, right? I, I see voices like, like Robert Kennedy Jr. as a way to, you know, put pressure for greater transparency on vaccines, for example, and, you know, the ingredients that go into them. Like, I think we need that across the board, across all agencies, like the FDA as well. You know, um, our food system needs a a lot more transparency. You know, the European Union, I think, does a better job than we do in a lot of ways. So, yeah, I, I... I think it's really interesting, but I don't, I don't really know, you know, what I'm going to do, like who I'm going to vote for. And sometimes I feel like I don't even want to vote for anybody. I I definitely don't want to vote for Joe Biden again, because I, I just, I, I don't see what his mandate is. He, I saw one of his ads where he was like, oh, we got to finish the job. And I just keep thinking, well, what was the job that you started? <laughs> you know, you came in and you claimed you were going to be the climate president and you're not. Right. You're still signing off on these oil drilling leases. And uh, yeah, we barely got the Inflation Reduction Act. OK, great. We got some good things out of there, but it wasn't what we really needed. So and so I just don't really take him seriously. I don't take him seriously uh, on climate change. He, you know, they, they like the administration barely even mentions climate change. So, uh, you know, he came in saying he was going to do a better job on COVID and he didn't do a better job on COVID. So I don't know what his mandate is. I would, I'm really, uh, you, and, you know, like Noam Chomsky said that we, we had to vote for Biden because Trump was going to start nuclear war. And then, you know, Russia invaded Ukraine and now we're seemingly always on the verge of nuclear war. So what was the point of voting for Joe Biden? Because he certainly hasn't stopped that and he hasn't done a very good job of diplomacy on the Russian Ukraine war either. So yeah, I just don't I, I just don't think I don't see myself voting for Biden. I I would love to vote for maybe somebody else who would primary him. And I just I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen on the Republican side either. I, all of them are scary. DeSantis is terribly frightening to me. I think he's like a, a competent fascist, uh, unlike Trump, who is an incompetent wannabe fascist. And I would almost want Trump over DeSantis if I had to choose, because I think DeSantis is extremely frightening on LGBTQ and trans 
rights especially and I think that uh, I worry that you know the worst could happen that we would march towards concentration camps for trans people LGBTQ people and I, I find that horrifying too so I just I don't know it's a scary time <laughs> to be alive <laughs> yeah and you know uh, this even this podcast, you know, we can't be all things to all people, right? There's a, you know, it's small and growing, uh, you know, thanks to what Mark had built and laid. And we have kind of a global audience as well, but mainly US based. And also being one of the few progressive m- media out there now in terms of, of Bitcoin, you know, I don't want to just have it be a, I'm going to come on here and just, you know, trash the right or whatever type thing. But there are certain things and, and, saying this for for bitcoiners who are listening or libertarians or those on the right like a lot of folks on the left myself and you margo included from what you just said you know there are some things that are happening on the right with desantis and some of that language that is not promoting freedom is not promoting good things and some people on the left will not move it's non-negotiable to look at any candidate if they're so blatantly advocating for like abolishing the department of education because they think that's popular or saying all of these things about the lgbtq community like when it starts with like humans and humanity like that is that's a non-negotiable for some people that's a non-negotiable for me right i don't care how much someone says they like bitcoin also it's just a politician saying things that's a non-negotiable starting place for me and for many on the left right so that's it's it's very real for many of us what we're what we're hearing we're taking these things at at face value and seeing what's playing out yeah, but you know, I'm I'm concerned because I actually see this anti-trans stuff being something that goes across parties and is more of a class thing maybe, but also not a class thing because I don't know if you saw this recently, Anna Kasparian from the Young Turks got a little bit of heat because she made some comments about uh, the trans about trans people, I guess, trans movements or trans rights movement. And I don't know, she was saying something about like, oh, you know, the civil rights movement, they they weren't aggressive or their tactics were nicer, I guess, or gentler, no, I didn't <laughs> which hear is this. so yeah. ridiculous, right? Because sure. that's the whitewashing, whitewashing of, that, yeah. of the civil rights movement, which, you know, there was plenty of violence and there was they were not asking for permission and they were not trying to be nice they were uh, there was civil disobedience it was nonviolent civil disobedience but they weren't welcomed you know they weren't respected when uh, martin luther king jr died when dr martin luther king jr died he was one of the least liked people in the country one of the top uh, so of for, the FBI wanted list, or yeah, search so list. Yeah, yeah. So for Anna Kasparian to say that, it's like, okay, you're really, you're really showing your, you know, how your ignorance and your privilege, and but also it highlights that you're even seeing people who generally are coming, who who you know you would say are like progressive or have some sort of foundation in the left, and they're saying comments like these, and you have someone like Jimmy Dore. So it's clearly moved in that direction of, you know, being skeptical of trans identity. And also he said some of the things about climate change. And of course, he's been very, you know, gung ho about vaccines and being opposed to the COVID vaccines. And I see his move there as being more of a working class thing. And so I think that we're missing an element here that is really important which is a class element too, you know, Anna Kasparian being a little bit, you know, not really in that class element because she is pretty wealthy being a host of Young Turks for so long. But but I think that there is this, there's like a class uh, element that we are missing that I think also goes back to Bernie Sanders when Bernie Sanders was running because he did very well in the rural counties and uh, Clinton uh, did well in the urban counties, but he always did very well in rural counties and in parts of the certain parts of the south i think but uh you know there is this feeling of being abandoned the working class white working class being abandoned and disenfranchised by the democratic party uh and i see that this component here and then the you know tie to the trans rights or trans identity or groomers or whatever like you know all of this is 
I feel is a way to, you know, still divide the working class. But also I see elements of the working class on the, you know, who would be progressive, who seem to be also open to the trans, you know, trans people as being bad people and being groomers. And so I think that we have to be mindful and be aware that not everyone who would benefit from progressive uh, policies uh, feels the same way that you and I do about trans people. And I know a lot of trans people and they're wonderful people and they're not groomers and they're not people who are putting their ideology or whatever, their lifestyle in anybody's face. Like they're literally just trying to survive and not, you know, commit suicide because of how dis- disconnected they feel from their bodies. You know, so I, I, for me, it's just so obvious, like trans people are real people with real feelings and, and have a right to exist, but not everybody feels that way, I think. And I think it may be because they don't know anyone who's trans <laughs> and also could also be religion as well. There's still a lot of that. So I think we have to just be mindful that, yes, a lot of us on the left, a lot of us who are pro- call ourselves progressives, like we, especially younger people like you and I, and it's very, it's a lot easier for us because we grew up, you know, being more open-minded to uh, different genders, uh, to, to the idea that gender is a spectrum or that uh, sexuality is a spectrum, you know, and but not everybody uh, feels that way. And I think that that's one of the reasons why I think the trans stuff is very scary because I think there is a potential to really unite <laughs> large groups of people, like, you know, just dis- dis- seemingly different groups of people around the idea uh, that trans people are evil and that they have to be exterminated. So yeah, that, that scares me a lot. So, but yeah, most of us, I think, support trans lives and support trans people and their right to exist and thrive. Yeah, I, I, I think such a huge part of it is people fearing that those people existing and being themselves are going to influence society and culture and their own children, right? Or they're like, well, I don't want my children or my family growing up seeing that, right? And again, some of the, and I I grew up in in the South, grew up in a very conservative place, you know, moved to New England as a late teenager and really learned and saw some of the things you're talking about. Um, You know, I didn't meet my first openly gay person until like late high school. Um, But what's weird is I think some of the foundational things I learned, whether it was family, even growing up religious and things like that is like, just accept and love people and just don't hurt other people. Right. And I think some of those foundational um, components, people are talking about, do we even have a soul as a nation? All of those things, you know, and I, I, you know, the Democrats say like soul of the nation, like that, that stuff a lot, but just in general, right. What I ask people, a lot of it is, you know, personal stories. Like, do you know someone, (laughs) do you, do you know someone who's, who's, who's openly gay or openly trans or something like that? Right. But also even beyond that, just taking a step back, like, Think really in terms of your own life. What is, what is that person, that movement doing? What are you feeling about it? Why are you feeling those things? Just really people need to self-reflect. And it really, really starts there in a lot of ways. And that's that's hard work when it's really easy in this day and age, again, to be distracted by Twitter fights, Facebook fights. Trump was a master um, marketer in terms of that, right? Some of these things that started with the Tea Party even before that. Um, really amplified under under Trump, but people taking a step back and especially those in the Bitcoin community. We, we talk a lot about freedom. We talk a lot about self-sovereignty. Um, and, you know, the episode I did with with Mark for our first episode back, he, he is brilliant in his discussion of, you know, the sovereign individual, not in terms of the book, but just that that concept of to be a sovereign individual means to to take care of other people and and take care of your community and be the best person you can be for yourself mentally, health wise, you know, what is in your control, right. Of trying to take care of your body, trying to take care of your mind and starting there. And, and we, as a, as a country, at least in the U S and globally, we're really missing that. 
and it's it it's creating all of these frightening realities. Um, it's very concerning. Yeah, you know, I think that's a really you raise a really good point in terms of what Mark was talking about because I think that that is a defining difference in perspective. Like, let's say from you know left libertarianism, which which is really you know like historically libertarianism really comes out of the left, right? Um, but an anarchism and that versus you know what tends to be the kind of libertarianism we see dominating the discourse in bitcoin on bitcoin twitter and it has to do with how you define liberty and again like david graver was somebody for me who really highlighted the different perspectives or like the two different views of liberty and one was like really like an authoritarian liberty in the sense that like I am free to do whatever I want. doesn't matter how it affects anybody else. I'm just, I should be allowed to do it no matter what, because that's my right. Whereas I think for us on the left, as left libertarians uh, and, and coming out of that rich history, that rich um, background that goes all the way back to the 1800s in terms of defining the, the, you know, the left, which is that, yes, I have liberty, but, but my liberty is defined by my relations with you, Trey, or with Mark, or with my community, or with other people. So there are limitations on my liberty, but it's because my liberty should not infringe on somebody else's liberty, right? So I define my freedom through my relations with other people. And that's not an authoritarian approach to liberty. That's, uh, you know, it is an individual approach that is also collective because I am also thinking about my community and how my actions reflect on the community and, and my family or my friends or, you know, or the stranger who, who I, you know, walk past every morning, right? So I think these are really important things to, to clarify that there are different ways to think about liberty. And I think most people think about their liberty in terms of how they define it in relation to other people. But the primary strain that is often talked about, like the an, an, anarcho-capitalists, for example, it's really like this individual, I'm, I should be allowed to do whatever I want and you can't tell me what to do, which to me is a really is like what David Graeber had defined as more like an authoritarian type of liberty, you know, you know, me and my little fiefdom, you can't tell me what to do kind of thing. And I, I think that's, that's problematic and will not get us very far if you're interested in adoption, in greater adoption of Bitcoin, because most people don't feel that way. I think that's a very unique uh, and privileged, let's say, perspective that is probably more found in the U.S. for some reason than other parts of the world. So, and and what you were saying too, you know, one of the I think foundational moments for me in undergrad was when I, you know, went to South Africa and studied, you know, Desmond Tutu, Nelson Mandela, this whole movement, and just you know how things have played out in in South Africa throughout their history and political history and combination of cultures, religions, everything, and how they've they got through difficult periods. And one of the Southern African philosophies of Ubuntu, which is exactly what mm -hmm. you're discussing, mm -hmm. which is, you know, I am because we are like, like my, exactly what you were saying. It's so beautiful. And ever since I kind of stumbled upon that and fell down that, that rabbit hole, um, I was like, that's, that's it, right? Like I grew up religious and then wasn't. And so my worldview was like, what, what is all of this? What is, what is the point? What it, what is anything? And that, that for me was really defining. And I think every action I try to take or every movement throughout the day, of course, it's not perfect is, is thinking about that. Like I am here and my humanity is tied up in, in your humanity, Margo, in, in that strangers, like you mentioned, and, you know, again, tying it, you know, for, for our audience that might be more progressive, we're going to have guests on that might push back more on some of these progressive ideologies but today <laughs> this being one for the the progressives uh that reach out to me and say hey i feel a little bit more heard and seen um you know you're you're welcome in this space and in in your own life and there's people that are fighting for you and that um want you to exist 
and that want you to be here. Um, so yeah, I mean, all of that tied together and to, again, not to name him specifically too much, cause there's many, many like him on any, any side, but you know, when DeSantis is playing, using, uh, immigrants, illegal aliens, these terms that they use, taking resources from Florida, going to Texas to help them ship immigrants to Martha's Vineyard here in Massachusetts. Wild for political points. Those are human beings, human families, human lives. And tying that to any sort of Judeo-Christian background as well is despicable from that background or or any human level background. So again, I don't know if I can comfortably talk politics or have a starting point B when when that is the game that's being played. When we're playing with human beings' lives, I'm not sure I can talk about, well, they like Bitcoin or they say they like Bitcoin or, well, you know, it's a, it's a non-negotiable for me. Yeah, I mean, Bitcoin is for anyone, of course. It's for anyone who needs it. But I don't think that we should, you know, applaud DeSantis if he ever gets Bitcoin, you know, it's like... Okay, well, you know, Bitcoin is it's, you know, it's a public network. It's for anyone who who wants it, who needs it, and great. Go ahead, use it, but I'm not going to sit here and say like, yeah, that's okay that he thinks trans people are subhuman or that he thinks it's okay to play with people's lives and ship them to another state and, you know, after they've already faced so much trauma just even trying to migrate from uh, they're challenging lives back home to the U.S. You know, people don't just pick up and leave just to cause DeSantis problems. You know, they 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 do it because they're really suffering back home and partly due to U.S. foreign policy. So uh, we are our country is responsible to a certain degree for what happened to them. So yeah, I'm not going to. It's you know, I don't. It's hard to just say like, oh, I'm going to give you a pass just because you like Bitcoin. You know, it's just great. We both like Bitcoin, but <laughs> you're a horrible person either way. Yeah, it's like, right, oh, great. Right, we right. both like, you know, it's like, oh, great. We both like to talk on the phone. <laughs> OK. Oh, yeah. great. We both send text messages with the same text messaging app. Congratulations. Right. But you're still a horrible person. Yeah. Oh, you eat at that restaurant? Me too. That's so cool. Yeah, yeah. that's great. That's yeah. great. Oh, you you use dollars. Congratulations. Right. So, yeah, yeah. so does everybody else. You know, I think we have to put things into perspective in that sense, too. Yeah, absolutely. Well, what, one closing thing for me. So if I think there are a lot of people, whatever their political persuasion, but let's say for, for folks on the left, um, you know, they're, they're kind of resonating with maybe some of the things we're talking, maybe all of the things, but some of the things we're talking about in terms of like, it's kind of the same stuff over and over, right? Um, we end up with candidates that we clearly see were kind of placed there that power by powers that be. Um, we feel like how much is our vote really impacting? Like what difference is being made in, in daily people's lives? Um, from, from your end, um, you know, in, in a simple way, obviously, because it's a complex question, but what, what do you think are some things that people can do or um, things that people can get involved with, um, whether that's Bitcoin or something else that, you know, in your experience, it feels like it can make a difference? Yeah, well, it's always hard to feel <laughs> like you can make a difference, I think. There's almost 8 billion people in the world and we're run by, most of our governments run by a very, very, very small percentage of the population. So it feels like it's very hard to make a difference. But I think that, at least for me, the best way to do that is to think about where you're natural talents lie what what's your skill set what are you good at and to find a way to make use of those skills to work towards something that you care about and I also think that we don't have to think so big scale either we don't have to think about you know only think about making a difference on the national or the global scale I think it's really important to focus locally as well and within your community because those are, are much easier wins as well. You can have a greater influence within your own community. It's a smaller group of people that you have to convince. You don't need as much money to do it. 
So I generally try to encourage people to look within their neighborhood, their community, whatever that may be, and see where you can make a difference there. Whether, you know, it's, you know, I don't know, maybe housing policy, renters policies, maybe it's education, school boards, maybe it's related to climate change, maybe you pass some kind of, you know, ordinance that makes it easier for people to, I don't know, decarbonize somehow or to retrofit their homes or to change the insulation, whatever it is, you know, you have to find a way to do it. And and I think those small, small wins are, are just as important as the big ones. But I, I also think it's important to think about things from Chris Hedge's perspective. And I, I always like his ideas on this. So and we mentioned Chris Hedges earlier, Trey, but maybe not everybody is familiar with Chris Hedges, but he used he was raised, I think, in the Baptist tradition and he became a minister. He went to like theological school and stuff like that. And but he's been just one of the leading thinkers or writers uh, on the left and modern left thinking and protests, especially. He became a journalist, and I think he was he was in Yugoslavia during all the, Serbia during the that big war that happened in the 90s, and that really had an effect on him. But, you anyway, know, so he talks about protests and why we do these things, why we go out and we stand up for something that, uh, you know, that we think is right, or we stand up against an injustice of some kind. And his main point is, you know, we don't do it because we think we're going to win. We do it because it's the right thing to do. And so I think that we have to remind ourselves that we may not win every battle, but it doesn't really matter. We just have to do what is right. And if everybody does what is right, you know, it'll be easier, right, hopefully, to win those battles. But we have to start from that point where it's like, it doesn't really matter what happens, win or lose, if we succeed or not. The point is, is that we're doing it because it's the right thing to do. And then I want to add in something from Rebecca Solnit, who wrote Hope in Darkness. I believe that's the, it's a little book called Hope in Darkness or Hope in the Dark, something like that. And basically what she says is like, you know, oftentimes we think that the things that we're doing don't make a difference or that we didn't we didn't do anything like we lost but usually it's the case that we don't see the results of what we did in the present until many years later and i think this is very true i, I don't think that for example i don't think that occupy was a failure although you know it could felt like it at at, at first because the government you know crushed the movement and evicted all the occupations, you know, but it really did make a difference. It did make it possible for Bernie Sanders to run. It got people thinking about income inequality in a way that they were not able to do before. It provided a language for us to have that discourse. And that hasn't really left us. And it it has made it possible for Wall Street bets even. And I would say it's made it possible for Bitcoin to to ha- to take off too because it brought all these issues into the public mind. So it, it so I, I would say it has been a success. It just wasn't a success that probably in the way that we thought we the successes that we wanted at the time. So I think that we have to not worry too much about whether what we're doing is going to make a difference or not, or whether we're going to win or not. It's just if you are upset about something and you want to see a change, you just need to figure out a way to to try to fight for it, to make it happen. And and you have no idea what the outcomes, the the side effects will be of your actions and what you just chose to do at that moment in time. So that's I guess that's my advice. Your your parting <laughs> just, wisdom. Just do it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, that's great. Um all right. So what are, you know, I know you, you, you also posted this on Twitter, but you got back from vacation. You were taking a little break from all of that lovely, um, lovely world. So what are, um, yeah. what are some things you want to publicly say that you're, that you're up to and, um, you know, what are you looking forward to in the next 
few months, six months, a year, that kind of thing. Yeah. Wow. I'm well, I'm really busy doing research. So that's my priority right now. We got one. So I wrote a grant proposal through the Bitcoin Policy Institute and we got it funded. So that's really exciting. So I'm working on that, on that with Troy Cross and PPI in general. We're putting this together. We're going to be doing some, some emissions modeling and some modeling of the network. And hopefully the end result will be a policy report that we can share with policymakers about Bitcoin. Because the thing that we've heard is that the policymakers understand the talking points, but there's no data to back that up. So our goal with this grant is to get that data. And it's going to be going to keep us very busy. It's going to keep me very busy because I'm doing the modeling, most of the modeling on that. And then I'm also working with Block Green, building a sustainability framework for them. So um, that's also really exciting, trying to figure out how to onboard miners, Bitcoin miners uh, that are somehow sustainable. So, you know, I'm trying to figure out what that framework will be to evaluate their sustainability, their environmental impact. Uh, so that's also keeping me busy. And then I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to be doing with my PhD, uh, whether I'm going to finish at Georgia Tech or uh, go to Oxford and finish it there. So, yeah, so I'm going to be working on a, like a, a new thesis proposal, uh, although I think it's probably going to be similar to the one that I wrote that my advisor hated. <laughs> right. But, which, you were also, but, which you were also public about, and people can, you know, take a look if they want to, but um, yeah. Yeah, they can see my threads on that, and yeah, also yeah. the What Bitcoin Did podcast if they want to hear more mm. about uh, what happened there. But yeah, so I'm trying to figure it out, and I think I'll know more about that at the end of the year or the start of 2024, what which direction I'm going to go in that regard. So yeah, it's just really exciting in a way that I'm actually doing the things that I want to do for the first time in a long time. Mm. And it's really nice to be able to do that. So, and it's all, you know, it's all Bitcoin related, which is, yeah. which is really cool too. And I'm mostly, I like, I'm just kind of rebuilding my life a little bit because everything that happened at Georgia Tech was, uh, was like a couple of years of intense trauma. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, and I mean, and not all of it was just, I, not, I didn't discuss all of it on what Bitcoin did, but yeah, it's like for the first time I'm sort of doing what I want to do and mm -hmm. trying to find myself and rebuild my identity in a way. And it's been nice. Yeah. yeah that's awesome. Well, we're rooting for you. Um, you're going to do great things. <laughs> Excited to see what else comes from your collaborative work, but also just excited and uh, happy that you're finding that, you know, fulfilling happiness, which everyone is, is seeking. So that's great. Um, where, where should people go to, to find you and your, your musings and, and other things? <laughs> well, obviously Twitter is the best way to find me. I'm Jen Urso. Well now I'm, uh, yeah, you can still find it in my name, but I've, I also have Margo Pies in I saw <laughs> on my that Twitter like account weeks now. Ago or something. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I decided, it, you know, some people had suggested maybe it, I should put my name up on there now that that might, you know, I'm not, don't really have much to hide anymore right. from the university. So I thought about it and said, yeah, I guess probably right now is a good time to do that. So yeah, you can find me Margo Pies on Twitter, but also my, I'm Jen, I'm at Jen or so J Y N underscore U R S O. So Yes, you send me a DM. My DMs are open. That's usually the best way to contact me. And then I have a link tree link on there and links to my Medium articles where I've, I've written about degrowth and uh, climate change related to Bitcoin. So that's probably where, you, you know, the most central, you know, place to find me. And I'm also on Noster. So you can just ask me for my pub key and I'll be happy to send that to you too. Your, your end pub, that's it. My end pub. Yeah. Um, awesome. Thank you so much for doing this. This was a pleasure. Really exciting. Um, you know, I think this will be well received for a lot of progressives who, whether you're new to Bitcoin, whether you're in Bitcoin and you're like, yes, and 
you know, if you disagree with some of the points we're saying, that's okay too. Um, hit us up respectfully. Uh, you know, we're here to we're here to chat as well. Um, but thank you, Margo. It's a pleasure. Yeah, thanks for having me. This was great.